Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Virtual Ninja Show. Today we are going to talk about PowerShell and I have Miriam with me. Before we get there, please check out aka.ms slash ninja show to see all the upcoming episodes. Maybe you missed one that we already streamed, so you can of course also go back and watch episodes on demand. And then when you watch this video and you have any questions, please ask them in the comments. Also, we are always happy to hear further recommendations for upcoming episodes. And now, Miriam, I'm so excited that we finally made it onto the episode here, onto the show. Um, and you, yes, introduce yourself quickly before I ask you all the interesting questions. Hi there. Um, I'm Miriam, Miriam Wiesner. I work as a security researcher at Microsoft. I also recently wrote a book about PowerShell cybersecurity and automation. And I'm so happy that we finally made it on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Heike. Thank you, Miriam. Yes. So, and because of the book, we actually thought, hey, let's come together and talk about it and show people some of the examples that you um, shared in your book. But I know that you also wrote a couple of extra examples um, for the show. But let's quickly talk a little bit about um, the book. So the book is for red and blue teams in the cybersecurity world. Uh, what can people expect from the book? When I wrote the book, I wanted that it is, that it's understandable for beginners and that it also would benefit advanced PowerShell practitioners. Um, so in the book, um, we have three sections. First, we are getting started with the technologies. Then we are digging deeper uh, and also uh, learning how to access the system, how to use identity. So we are also diving in Active Directory and Entra ID. And last but not least, we are also looking into mitigations and um, things that you can do to uh, yeah, better secure your environment. And um, in the mid part, we have also uh, a blue teamer and a red teamer cookbook. So basically useful scripts and uh, commands that are either useful for uh, blue team PowerShell practitioners or for red teamers. Okay. And so usually PowerShell, I know PowerShell from a black window. And I think the logo, the icon was like blue with like the... Um, I don't even know how they're called, but yes. Um, and you run it on a local machine, but with Defender XDR, you can also use PowerShell in live response. So when is what being used? Like when do you use it directly on the machine versus when are you going to do this in a live session? Can you uh, educate me a little bit? There are different use cases. So if you work with PowerShell only, um, of course, it makes a lot of sense to use PowerShell remoting because you can access multiple machines at once with the same PowerShell command. But to do this, you need to enable PowerShell remoting on your endpoints, of course. Uh, so there is some work involved beforehand. Um, if you did that, that is great because it really helps you to speed up your management of your environment in a secure way. Um, but in some cases, the customers did not yet enable PowerShell remoting in the environment. And they have, for example, an incident uh, that they want to investigate, um, but they have, for example, Defender running in their environment. Um, so in this case, they could use live response to quickly run PowerShell scripts on the endpoint and to collect the data that they need to collect or to end processes or services uh, and do basically the tasks that they want to. Yeah, and um, I want to remind everyone, we actually did an episode on life response. Um, so if you are wondering how to get started with life response, how to get your scripts up there, so in your inventory, you can actually run it. Have a look at that episode. We also discuss um, signed or unsigned scripts and all the important security methods and best practices. 
And um, in your regular world, in the research world, Miriam, are you using PowerShell or is this like your hobby and your big interest of you or like how is the connection there? Um, so, yes, both. So, um, of course, it is super interesting to me. And um, I also got the chance to use PowerShell in my daily work. So currently I'm working on some simulation parts. I'm simulating um, some attacks, uh, which we saw out there in the wild. And I'm currently simulating those attacks uh, to also write detections uh, for, the, for it and to test our detections that we wrote. Okay, Miriam. So I know we are here to actually look at some example scripts that you either wrote for us, thank you, or you brought um, from your book. And of course, book was referred a few times and we will put the link um, for everyone in there. Now I'm excited to have a look uh, into the demos that you brought with you. So the first one, if I remember correctly, is about stopping a process. Yes. And um, it's a basic script, um, but super useful, right? So you have a malicious process, a suspicious process or anything running. How would you execute it? What would you do? First, I would look into the processes. So you can do that using the command processes in live response. Mm -hmm. And once you found the right process, you get its process ID copy it and run the command um, run invoke stop process with a parameter process ID and apply the right process ID. Um, the process is stopped and you can evaluate if everything worked again with using the command processes. Perfect. Another one that I think can be very useful for people um, if they are in a, you know, incident response scenario right now, investigating to understand what's the current firewall looking like. Yes. <laughs> um, so you basically, let's have a look at the script. So you're basically asking for the different profiles for the firewall on that client. Yes. So you can query with this script by profile name and get all rules that are available for that profile. Mm -hmm. And in our demo, we are looking for all rules that are available for the public profile. And if you take this script as a base for your own um, environment, you can also uh, adjust the script and apply it to your own needs. So for example, you can do a for each object and just uh, output all rule names if you are not interested in the rest of the rules. But let's have a look um, how that looks like. Yes. We run the get firewall rules, PS1, with the parameter profile name. And we specify that we want to see all public profiles. It collects the data. And you get all firewall rules back that are applied for the public profile. Of course, you can do this as well for domain profile or for local profile. And you can also adjust the script to your needs so that you have more filtering options, for example. OK, so now, Miriam, what's the next script? It looks much longer and more sophisticated. What's this about? I used to work a lot with event logs in the past, and that is an event log based script. There is an option to log what code was executed. So what PowerShell code was executed. It is called script block logging. And if you enable script block logging, you can find all executed code in the PowerShell operational log under the event 4104. And what this script is doing, it extracts the executed code and delivers it in a easier readable way so that mm -hmm. you don't have to search event logs manually by yourself. And additionally, if it was a very long script that was executed, it is split in the, it is split in the event log 
into several parts, which is called a multi-part event. So for example, you have seven parts, which describes just one script. And if you would just examine the event log for the executed code, you would have to get into the first event, then into the second event, the third, and so on, until you saw all seven events, just to understand what the script did. And um, with this get executed code script, um, it already merges the executed code like if it was never split. Wow. Okay, so then let's have a look. I think the script is long, but if, of course, people are interested, they can go and grab it from the GitHub repository. Let's have a look how it's exactly. being executed. Yes. So you have the parameters, search word, user ID, level, and path. You can search for certain parameters, but you can also look what user executed a certain kind of code. So if you already know what account you are looking for, that might be the parameter for you. Then we also have the level. So for example, critical, warning, informational, you can also filter for that. And the path in which the script or the code was executed. And um, this is just basically the code. Like I said, we have here the multi-part events logic, we have the regular events logic, and in the end, we have the filtering, and all events are being returned in the end after filtering and after merging everything that you need. So let's look into the demo, how that works executing-wise. Yes. So we run get executed code, PS1. And if you, for example, want to search for Mimikatz in the code, then you can use the search word parameter and specify Mimikatz. Of course, mm -hmm. it is also possible to specify other search words. But <laughs> um, in this case, uh, we know that it was some invoke Mimikatz action on this host, and we want to have proof for that. And here are the events. So you can see time created. You have a nice PS custom object and you see the executed code. Here you go, invoke Mimikatz. You have the time, uh, you have the user, you have the level and all the information. And using this, you can, of course, also filter. If you want fewer information shown, you can also say for each object and just filter for the code. So, And this is now going through the event logs on the machine? This is in the event log. Wow, that was quick. Nice. I think you brought another script, right, from your book? I brought from my book is the get PS history. Um, you need to understand that there is a difference between um, the event logs and PowerShell history logs. So if you run um, PowerShell commands and if you press the up arrow, you see that your last commands will be reflected and you are able to run them again. And this is basically the history. And mm -hmm. um, by looking at the history, we can also learn a lot what the users on this host ran. And um, we can see that, um, so we have um, certain users on the system and we have different places where this history file is saved. So I'm not only talking about human users, I'm also talking about service users. That's why there are different places. In here, in this script, we are looking into all those places and merging everything into one output. Nice. So we run the get PS history script, give it some time, and you see we have the history here. So you can see here, um, we use the hashtags in the script to separate PowerShell history files from another. 
And in here, you see this is the PowerShell history file of the user hacker. And you see that this guy had some malicious intent and did some bad things. So this guy ran invoke mimicats, tried to disable Defender, and also uh, did some discovery, tried to find out who are the administrators who might be a valuable account. And if you are in the middle of an investigation, it might be valuable to understand what commands were executed in which order and also um, the entire history of the user. So in this case, we have the PowerShell history of all users unless it was deleted. So if the file is deleted, then of course we, we don't have it. But in the console host history txt files, we have the complete history. Um, there is also another way to get the PowerShell history um, by using the get history cmdlet. But this cmdlet, what we are not using in this example, would only get the current shell's history. Um, so that means only the session that you initiated. Um, and if you close the session, all the history would be gone. And this is why we are looking into the console host history file in this script example, because we can look uh, way beyond the last session. Okay, so there is the one, of course, that is in that current session, mm -hmm. but it's also written somewhere else, and that's where you are looking at. Exactly. Okay. And um, why I mentioned the get history cmdlet is because most people would first, of course, use the get history cmdlet because that seems natural. But you would only get the current shell's history. And um, to get the entire history of every user on the system, um, we need the script. So this is the value of the script. Nice. So Miriam, thanks first of all to walking us through live response and showing some examples. But at the beginning, we talked about PowerShell is also, of course, used in on the client directly or remote shell. Um, so the last script is not via live response. So how are we getting started with that? And what are we doing? Yes, so the last script um, we are using to scan for updates. So one task of a blue teamer is to check if there are updates available. And one big benefit of this script is that it uses the WSUS catalog, so the cap file, directly to scan the machine, the target machine, if they are missing updates. Uh, what many people don't know is that if you only use Windows for scanning updates, or if you only use WSUS to verify if all updates are available, people might miss important updates. Therefore, we always recommended in the past, or at least when I worked as a consultant, I always recommended in the past to also have a script available to scan for missing updates. One reason why updates uh, do not show up in the WSUS console is that you might have not configured to check for all updates. So one big example for that is, for example, C++ updates, or, uh, other uh, additional updates that mm -hmm. come with third-party products, for example, and you never considered that you will get updates through WSUS. And okay. to avoid those vulnerabilities, because a missing update is always a vulnerability that attackers can use. And to avoid those vulnerabilities, ensure that you scan your systems on a regular basis for missing updates and install them. And you, as you mentioned before, the beauty is that you can already target multiple devices, right? It's if you yes. want. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in our example, we are just scanning the local host. 
which is also uh, one functionality, but it is also possible to scan multiple targets at once. So you have the script here. And for example, because you asked if it's possible to target multiple hosts at once, uh, we have this example here where you say remote hosts and you can specify comma separated values, the hosts that you want to scan. We have uh, some options. So we have the cap path. That is the path where uh, the WSUS file, the catalog should be stored. And um, we have a default path. So if nothing is configured with this parameter, it will be stored in the temporary folder of the user that is executing the script. We can specify remote hosts, one or more. And if this parameter is not specified, then only the local host will be scanned. We have the force parameter. So if the file is present, then it will be deleted and downloaded again, because sometimes uh, you might have an old version on your host. And last, we have the parameter do not delete cap file. That is, for example, a reason why you have an old version on your host. Um, the advantage of leaving the file on the host is that it takes some time to download it because it's, yeah, it, it has quite a size. Um, but the disadvantage of leaving the file on the host is that you might want to have the latest version. So if you don't want to download the file from multiple machines at the same time, you might want to think about a deployment mechanism that you just download it once to one location and, um, for example, on a network share something and have your uh, hosts use that. But you can also just have every host download it. So I open the PowerShell console and execute scan remote updates. So um, I execute it without the parameter and without the remote host specified, that means that we are scanning the local host. And now you see we are downloading the cap file and this takes quite some time. And this is also, in my opinion, the reason why we can't execute the script via live response, because live response just cuts um, script execution uh, if it takes too long, at least uh, in my attempts. And the file is downloaded and now the hosts are scanned. So I recommend fetching yourself a nice cup of coffee while you're scanning your hosts, especially if you're scanning multiple hosts at the same time. Um, it is necessary, but it takes some time because you can imagine how many updates there are and how for how many vulnerabilities you need to scan. Okay, let's have a look on how it looks like after it has been done. So what can people expect? And here you go. You see that the latest patch from February 2024 is missing. Okay, so it basically it doesn't show you all the things that are and you have to figure out. It really shows you the latest patches that are missing. Exactly. Very nice. And then you can go ahead and um, install them. There are also options available via PowerShell to get the latest patches installed, but you can also use uh, the UI. I think not everybody is such a PowerShell geek. <laughs> I love my UI. I love clicking around and clicking switches and toggles and pictures. That's more than, more me. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Miriam. And of course, um, if people want to start learning PowerShell as well as getting deeper into the details, they can go get your book. And the book is available as a paper book. Perfect. And then also as a PDF or a Kindle version. And yes, everyone, please go grab the book and leave a review um, for the book underneath. Thanks again, Miriam, for joining the show. I hope I will see you back again when you write the next book. And for everyone out there, thanks for watching and see you in the next episode. Bye.